this game is a competitive game. And I think a lot of times though, people would think, oh, well, won't being a Christian make you soft? I'm just like, no, man, like the word tells me uh, to work as if I'm working for the Lord, you know, to, to, to work for my earthly masters if I'm working for, for the Lord. And so um, it keeps me grounded, uh, it keeps me hungry. It's been the only thing that I pretty much feel like has kept me steady through my football career. There's things greater than football. Um, you know, there. I, I just get down on my knees every morning and I pray to, to thanking, thanking him uh, for everything that I have. Uh, I know it's never just about me. There's, uh, there's a lot of things working in my favor. My faith in Christ is something that's unwavering. Uh, special teams can come and go, and eventually I'm not going to, you know, play in Kansas City or in the league. Always be a fan, but my faith in Christ is going to. You know, take me all the way to the to the other side. To it. But for me, my faith is watching Christ do certain things, praying about Him. This year has been fun because we started with an empty little bottle, and it was uh, and we were talking about the faith of a mustard seed. And after our first win, I gave everybody one, and you know now we look at this thing, and it has like 15 mustard seeds in it, and you think that the bottom of that thing has these muscle seeds, but the guys keep saying, remember when it was empty? And so for us, our faith is watching Christ grow and taking something small and making it get a lot larger. We all have a, a, a journey to walk, a path that God has laid before us. And in that path, it, we're going to have the, the vicissitudes of life hit us, and we have to use our faith to overcome those vicissitudes and those struggles. My favorite Bible, Bible verse is Psalms 23, four through six. Uh, even though I walk through a valley of shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for God is with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they come from me. And I believe that uh, so, so much because I can look down in my chest and see that verse. And even if I'm going through something, man, I know that there's always light at the end. I approach every single day with, you know, he knows what's going to happen. You know what I mean? So I, I just, I, I fully submit and, you know, I try to do as much as I can each and every single day uh, and, and every Sunday when I, when I play. So. You know, I give it all that I have, and you know, whatever happens, um, it was meant to be. This, this game, man, is, is so crazy. There's a lot of lights on you. There's a lot of uh, opinions thrown at you. Um, but at the end of the day, it's, it's, it's like every other system in the world. It's a performance-based system. And to know that in Christ, uh, I'm in a, I, it's not performance-based. It's, it's based off nothing that I've done. It's all based off what Jesus Christ has done for me. Um, that, that keeps you really steady, and that helps you sleep at night, uh, knowing that, um, that in Him, I already have victory. My faith has always been big with me. I, I was raised that way, and uh, it, it's something where I, I go out there knowing that I'm, I'm playing uh, for Him every single day, and, and that I'm playing for God, and I'm playing to go out there and glorify Him. And obviously, I want to win every game, but as long as I, I'm glorifying Him every single time I'm out there, I'm a, I can walk with my head held head held high when I get off the field. Well, I guess there's something going on today, like a Super Bowl or something. So for those of you who, uh, who have a team still in the hunt, like congratulations, well done. Uh, how many of you guys are rooting on for Kansas City? Yeah. Yeah. How many of you are rooting on for the 49ers? Well, there's a few of you. Uh, how many of you are rooting on for the commercials? Yeah, yeah. And how many of you are all about the halftime show? <laughs> There's a lot of lion hips in here, I think. Mean. You'll get it later. So, my very first NFL football game was the Carolina Panthers and the Kansas City Chiefs. So it was at Kansas City at Arrowhead Stadium, and it was super exciting to be there. Yes, I was wearing enemy colors, but I grew up a Kansas City Chiefs fan. I'm still a Kansas City Chiefs fan, but it is way second. To Carolina and that's just because I followed a team from the beginning so if you don't know that story like that's that's the only reason like I've never been to Carolina I've never pet a, a panther before like I don't I don't know any of that stuff it's just like hey I can follow from the very beginning and that would be cool and so I have and now my team is like self-destructed it's blown up I don't know what's gonna look like next year and so it's it's just kind of a crazy mess of a roller coaster and who knows maybe in a couple years I'll be a Chiefs fan uh, so <laughs> we'll see what that looks like. Uh, I, I always said, like, if, if Josh McDaniel came over to Carolina, I'm done. Like, I don't know, maybe we have some pa uh, Patriots fans in here. Woo! I've kind of have mixed feelings on this because there's no team to root against this year. Uh, 
<laughs> but uh, that being said, uh, we, we are so excited to celebrate uh, football, but more than that, faith. And it's cool to see some of these guys kind of sharing their life and their testimony and their story with us. I did promise to you uh, that not only could you wear your jerseys if you wanted to, by the way, like we have a, a, just a conglomeration of different jerseys. It's so cool to see the, the diversity in the body of Christ coming together to serve one God. Football can do that. Jesus, man, he is powerful enough to bring people together. They also said something about nachos. So if you're still waiting on the nachos, it's going to be after I get done talking because I don't want to hear you like chewing with your mouths open and stuff. So we'll have nachos here in a bit. Uh, you can take my word on that and we'll make that happen. We are in a series called Fixer Upper and it's about getting our lives uh, put back together with Jesus. And so we've talked about some pretty important pieces that kind of help build this uh, thing along the way. So we want to change and that's like new year, new you kind of a thing. Uh, but it's really about changing the right way and changing God's way so that we can experience freedom and some of that freedom really is about having wisdom. God's wisdom, we're going to His Word and trying to find His source for things. And we also need to make sure that we find rest. Anybody do well with that this last week? Like you made it a, a conscious decision to, to seek a little bit more rest? No? Some of you are like, no, I just took a nap. Like you were done talking and I was like, okay, I'm out. Uh, and some of you are like, no, I just felt guilty for not resting. Yeah, like that's the world we live in, right? But hopefully it kind of helps to recalibrate the system a little bit. And today we're talking about happiness. And so all of this is like the beginning of a journey through a book called Core 52, which really isn't like a book on its own, but it's more of like some commentary on 52 core verses that most pastors will, will preach through. And matter of fact, as I've been looking at this uh, series and all the year, I'm like, Gosh, we just talked about that, and we just talked about that, and we just talked. So how do I make this fresh and make it new again? But if you want to pick up one of the Core 52 books, there are some in the back. They're $12, and uh, if you don't have $12, they're free. So whichever way works for you. Elijah, would you grab me a glass of water, please? <coughs> I have had uh, a bit of a sore throat the last couple days, and it's better, but once I started talking, it's not better. Uh, so here it is. Declaration of Independence. Maybe you've seen these words before. We hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their Creator with certain unalienable rights, that among them are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. The pursuit of happiness. Anybody like to be happy? A few of you know, not so much. Like, you're just pretty happy being miserable, apparently. And that's what makes you happy. Thank you. Uh, so what I would like you to do is in your tables, like you don't have to move, but I want you to find one or two people that you can ask this question to. Like, what is something that makes you happy, right? If you already discussed it, like re resurface that in one minute, I'm going to bring you back to the table. What makes you happy? Your pursuit of happiness. All right, let's shout it out. What are some different things that make you happy? Not all at once, though, because then I'll just hear like, Bleh. right? What's something that makes you happy? I said not all at once. What's the deal? I heard something over here. Grandbabies. Cooking? Cooking cookies. Eating cookies. I don't know. What's that? Nature. Nature. Jeeps. Jeeps. You would. <laughs> I know a lot of people find happiness in family. A lot of people find happiness in work, in doing something with their hands. A lot of people find happiness in being done with work. Uh, some of us, we find happiness in football. Right? There's lots of different things that we find our happiness in, but in this chapter of the book on happiness, chapter 9, it kind of talks about how we are hardwired for happiness, basically meaning that God created us with this drive to pursue 
happiness. In my mind, like I had to wrestle with that a little bit. Like, yeah, God, he's the father. We're the kids. He wants us to be happy. We all want like our kids to be happy. But he's more concerned with we find happiness the right way. Because if we don't, then we're not going to be as happy as we think we are. Like it's a short term buzz that we get on our happiness. And, and so when we're hardwired for happiness, it's kind of like a lion is hardwired to hunt. A monkey is hardwired to climb. A cat is hard. Well, I don't know about cats. Let's move on. God created us with this desire to be happy. But the question is, how? Right? How are we going to pursue happiness? And, and the key verse or verses for this week is Psalm chapter 1, verses 1 through 3. And we're going to unpack that a little bit here. Uh, and then we'll, we'll branch over into some other passages. It says in Psalm chapter 1, verse 1, page 448 in the Bibles we provide. Blessed is the man. Blessed is a, is a Bible word for, for happiness, but more of kind of a holy happiness. Like the way that God wants you to be. Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the wicked, nor stands in the way of sinners, nor sits at the seat of scoffers. Right? It's all about relationships. And it's highlighting here that if you want to be blessed, if you want to have a, a holy kind of happiness, it's making sure that you're not surrounded by the wrong kind of people. And you and I need to, to pursue that. And since we're Connection Christian Church, let's maybe state it this way. Right, that we need to connect with people. One of the ways that you and I get to be happy, that we're designed to be happy, is God has hardwired within us this drive to be with other people. Matter of fact, he says in Genesis, it's not good for man to be alone. We're created in the image of God, which, by the way, in Genesis also highlights that there are different parts of this one God. Right, that the spirit was over the surface of the deep, that the word was spoken. And in John chapter one, we see that that is Jesus. There is a, a unity even within God and we're not created to be alone. But our drive to be, you know, not alone should not lead us to wrong relationships. But oftentimes it does. Somebody once told me when I was growing up, it's like if you get a, a boy, you've got a boy. If you get two boys, you got half a boy, three boys, no boys at all. And maybe you find that to be true. I'm one of three brothers as we were growing up. Uh, as many of you know, I also have a half brother that uh, I didn't get to hang out with, but I'm sure that that would have only amplified the trouble, right, that we found ourselves into. Guys, when you put them together, like we come up with these ideas, some would call them great ideas, they're usually pretty stupid, right? And we're, we're usually needing somebody to bail us out because when we get our minds together, we do some, some pretty crazy things. And one of the things as a pastor that I've had to deal with over the years, whether I was doing youth ministry or adult ministry, is that people tend to make certain choices in life and they, they tend to maybe leave the, the spiritual behind and they get together with this group of friends and they pursue other things and they have this desire at one point in time to change their life. But when people try to change their life, without changing the friends that they do that with, it's usually very short-lived. Right? Maybe you can serve as a testimony to that. But one of the hardest, hardest, but most beneficial choices you can make if you want to change your life, aside from seeking God first, is to surround yourself with the right kind of people. Surround yourself with the right kind of people. Blessed is the man who does not walk in the counsel of the wicked. The wicked. Psalm chapter 1, verse 2 says, But his delight, right, his happiness is in the law of the Lord, and on his law he meditates day and night. On his law he meditates day and night. So for you and I, we need to connect with God, and, and specifically here it's through his word. Right? When we put ourselves in the position to be a, a student of God's word, if we allow it to fill us every cavity of our being, that we are connecting more truly with what God desires in our life. So we connect with the right people, but we also need to connect with the Word of God. And then the third part goes on to say this, 
He is like a tree planted by the streams of water that yields its fruit in its season, and its leaf does not wither. In all that he does, he prospers. It's like a tree that's planted and it yields its fruit. There's something natural that comes from that. We talked about that a little bit last week, that the fruit of the Spirit, when you have the Spirit of God in you, it produces these certain traits that happen. But I would also like to indicate that it, it talks a little bit about like living out what's going on inside. When you and I plant the Word of God inside of our lives, when you and I put ourselves with the right kind of people, we can't help but have this fruit in our life that is directed at loving towards the people. And one of the primary ways we do that is in service. So our core four, four core values around here, we call them the Connect Four, is to connect, right? Connect with God, connect with, with God's people, and connect God's people back to Him. That we grow, we dive deeper into God's Word, we allow it to, to penetrate to the core of our being and change us from the inside out. And in doing so, we understand the unconditional love of God, which inside of us is like a catalyst that launches this unconditional love into every other relationship that we've got. And we begin to serve these other people. And when we serve them, not out of selfish motives, but out of the selfless love of God, then it begins to change things. And people go, well, that's kind of strange. What's up? And it gives us an opportunity to connect them with God. Right? So we connect, grow, love, and serve. And so if we go to Psalm chapter 1, we connect with the right kind of people. Right? We connect with God's Word, but then we are a tree planted by the stream and we bear fruit. We, we go out and we serve these people. We connect these people back to God. Right? Not necessarily the right kind of people, but all people. Right? Because we're trying to have a good relationship with them. I want to take you now to 1 Thessalonians. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verses 16 and 17. It's pretty hard, like these, these words. There's only two of them. But it, the problem isn't either one of these words. It's when you put them together. But these two verses start this way. Rejoice always. Rejoice always. Always pray without ceasing, give thanks in all circumstances, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. Think about this for a moment. <coughs> rejoice always. How, how difficult is it to rejoice all the time? You lose a job, rejoice always. Right? A child has turned their back on their faith and maybe on the family. Rejoice always. Your car isn't working again. Rejoice always. I want you to, to spend another minute at your tables and I want you to discuss this question. What makes it hard for you to rejoice always? What makes it hard for you to rejoice always? All right. What makes it hard for you to rejoice always? Stress. Sick. Anybody else? Worry. Worry. Other people's, Other people's attitudes, but never our own. <laughs> Impatience. There are so many things that make it hard to rejoice always. But I think that there are a couple of keys that come after this that kind of help to put us in a, a right posture. It says pray continually. Right? So we can rejoice always because we put ourselves in a posture of submission to God. Right? There's a lifeline connected to God. We pray continually. Uh, this doesn't mean like when you get up and when you go to bed. It doesn't mean like before each time that you eat or when somebody's driving you insane or when, you know, the wheels fall off of the bus or whatever, right? This is an ongoing lifestyle of prayer. And when we stay connected with God, guess what? It puts us in the right posture that we can be joyful always. Another thing that it says is give thanks to God in all circumstances. 
right? That you and I have an attitude of gratitude. That whatever is going on, we can appreciate what God is doing for us. And you know what? It may be rice and beans for the fifth night in a row, but God, you have provided rice and beans. Thank you, there is a meal to eat, right? There is always a way that you and I can bring back this gratitude. And the opposite of that is when you and I just take things for granted, right? We think that we deserve things. We think that, and commercials are telling us this now. Product lines are telling us, you deserve this. I think one of the kids had a Dr. Pepper, or one of the kids had a Dr. Pepper the other day, right at the top of it, it said, you deserve this, right? So after all, like, hey, I deserve it. I might as well have three, whatever the case might be. But you and I need to change that attitude for one that puts us in a proper posture with God. And we appreciate what he's doing. We put God first, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, it says in Matthew chapter 6, verse 33. Right? So we, we put ourselves in the right place. And then that establishes the priorities that kind of flow down from that. And that perspective gives us tons of ammunition. But I want to take you from 1 Thessalonians to James chapter 1. It's just a few pages down the line here. James chapter 1, page uh, 1011. And James is writing to the early church who is experiencing great turmoil because of their faith. They're being persecuted, scattered, killed. It's ridiculous. And this is what he says. Count it all joy, my brothers, when you meet trials of various kinds. For you know that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness. And let steadfastness have its full effect that you may be perfect and complete Lacking in nothing. Right? This is again about having perspective in life. That we realize that the difficult times actually make us better. Does that mean that you and I go, hey God, hook me up with some difficult stuff? No. <laughs> Matter of fact, if you're praying for that, I'll pray for you. Right? We don't want that. But having a proper understanding that God is for us, who can be against us, Right? That God works out all things within us who believe and are called according to His purpose that we are going to be okay. God is first and now I'm second. And now that I have the priorities right, I can begin to look at the perspective that I'm going to grow through this. Like, God's got my back. It doesn't mean that I'm going to you know, miss out on the storms of life, but that God is going to see me through. Now, I bet that if we took time to pause... And think about some of the difficult things that we've had to endure, right? Maybe you've lost someone close to you. Uh, maybe there has been a financial hardship in your life, right? Maybe you've gone through a divorce. Maybe there's been something else that, that has just really rocked your world. And if you look back on that, on this side of things, you can go, wow, I'm so much stronger or better or smarter because I've lived through that thing. Now, I don't want to go back and repeat it, <laughs> but I'm better for having done that. Right? It's proper perspective. And guess what? Whenever you, we, you and I can, we can look back on those kind of things and get this right perspective and we know that by right priorities, God is first, then that means every other time that we face difficulties... <laughs> This isn't an easy thing to do. But when we face those difficulties, we can rejoice always. We can have joy in our trials because we know that God is for us. Because we know that God will get us through that. And because we know that our hope is not anchored in our situation that we're dealing with right now. Right? But it stretches way farther than that. One of my favorite... Uh, video testimonies from the NFL actually happened during a live press conference. I don't even like the team. It's from the Jaguars. Like, they're the enemies that came out the same year as the Carolina Panthers. And so, uh, but there was a quarterback. Maybe you know his name, Nick Foles. Nick Foles played with the Philadelphia Eagles in the Super Bowl. 
right? Because Carson Palmer was injured and he went out and he led his team to victory. He was the MVP, but he was still second in command to Carson Palmer. And so he went to Jacksonville where he could get the starting position and he got injured. And so then there's this whole Minshew mania, you know, the guy with the crazy mustache and, and Gardner Minshew, he comes in and, and everybody is like crazy about him. And Nick Foles comes back from the injury. And this is a bit of his press conference. This is live to, like, to national media. This isn't a sidebar about his faith. I want you to listen in on this. Watching this young kid go out, this Minshew mania is going crazy. I know you're a man of faith, and I know you're trying, but you're also human. I mean, ever any doubts coming up in your mind as you go through that? Or? No, that's where you know, right when this, right when I felt this thing break, and I was going into the locker room, I just realized, you know, I just realized God, this wasn't exactly what I was thinking when I came to Jacksonville. Obviously, you come here and you want to create a culture and impact people, but at the end of the day, as I like, got, this is the journey you want me to go on. I'm going to glorify you in every action, um, good or bad, and. You know, I still could have joy in an injury. Um, and that, that's, people hear that and say, that's crazy. But it's like when you believe in Jesus and you, you go out there and you play, and that's, that changes your heart. And you only understand it when, you know, that purpose in your life, just like when I hoisted the Lombardi trophy. The reason I'm smiling is my faith was in Christ in that moment. And I realized I didn't need that trophy to define who I was because it was already in Christ. And that's my message when I play. Same thing happens when I get injured. We tend to make this so much about us as human beings. We tend to make it about us as athletes. It's not about us. It really isn't. If you make it about yourself, you're probably going to go home at night, lay your head on your pillow, and be very alone and very sad. And then hopefully someday you can find that purpose in your life because my purpose isn't football. It's impacting people. And I, my, my ministry happens to be the locker room. And I've been able still to get to know people, get to know these guys through an injury. Though I might not be playing that is difficult from a fleshly perspective, but from the spiritual perspective, from my heart, I've been able to grow as a human being to where I feel like I'm at a better situation here as a person than I was before because of the trial I just went under. And I know that's a sermon in itself, but that's how I go through life. And the good Lord's been there to, you know, it's not always about prosperity. I don't believe in the prosperity gospel. I believe if you read the word of God and you understand it, there's trials along the way, but they equip your heart to be who you are. So um, when I step on the field, I'm going against a man in Frank Reich who's very similar. He's a guy that I admire more than anything. He's a guy that has impacted my life so much, and he's going to be on the opposing sideline. So um, that's going to be fun. I don't know if you caught it, but he said, I can still have joy in an injury. And he talked about even whenever he was hoisting the Lombardi Trophy, the championship trophy of the NFL, the climax that most people are are just chasing after as professional football players. And he says, the reason I was smiling was not because of the Lombardi Trophy. It was because of my faith in Christ. And he talked about having a job to do, but I want you to see his priorities, right? My job is to minister in the locker room, right? That's, that's primary. Secondary is being a football player, but primary is serving God. Any question at all where he finds his joy? No. Right? And this is the kind of joy that I'm talking about, the kind of happiness that's not based in the temporary, but based in the eternal. Matter of fact, uh, 1 Peter uh, chapter 1, we hit this uh, a few months ago uh, in a, a sermon series. It's probably actually like last summer, so if you want to go back and look that up, you sure can. Uh, but 1 Peter chapter 1, Peter is again writing to persecuted believers uh, in this passage several times over, he calls them as aliens, like they don't belong here. They stand out. They're strangers. And he says, blessed, what was that word again? Blessed to be happy, right? <clears throat> blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. According to his great mercy, that means we don't deserve it, but we get it anyway. He has caused us to be born again into a living, say that word with me, a living what? Hope, a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Right? Because Jesus has conquered the dead, you and I have a living hope in Jesus. Our hope did not die when he died. Our hope is eternal. Our hope conquers death. Our hope is not in the divorce, right? Or the marriage. Our hope is not in the friendship. Our hope is not in the finances. Our hope is not in the workplace. Our hope is in Jesus Christ and His resurrection from the dead. And in that, guys, we can find happiness 
In that we have a transcendent joy. And it says in verse 6, In this you rejoice, though now for a little while, if necessary, you have been grieved by various trials, so that the tested genuineness of your faith, more precious than gold that perishes, though it is tested by, by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of of Jesus Christ. A couple of things there. Number one is that we understand that we may face trials now, but the trials now are temporary. The hope is eternal. Right? But the trials now, what, what happens in that? We are refined by that fire. It makes us better. And it results in praise and glory to God. God gets the glory for everything that you, go, you and I go through. If you and I are, are constantly making right decisions and never having to go through the difficult time, guess who gets the glory then? You and I. We're pretty quick to grab the glory. Look what I did. Look what I've done. But this is all about what God has done for us and in us and through us. Right? And then not only is our hope in the resurrection, the living hope in the resurrection of Jesus, but our hope is also in Jesus coming again. Right? So it's looking forward to something else. So we need to have the right priorities and the right per perspective, but we also need to be anchored into this living hope. It goes on to say, therefore, preparing your minds for action and being sober-minded to set your hope fully on the grace that will be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. As obedient children, do not be conformed to the passions of your former ignorance, but as he who called you is holy, you also be holy in your conduct. This is interesting because it kind of goes back to that first one we talked about change. Remember Romans chapter 12, verse 2, for those of you who were here. Do not be conformed any longer to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your, your mind. Set your, your minds on the hope that is in Jesus. Right? This is where the transformation takes place. This is where you and I get to do crazy things like rejoice always. Or consider it joy when you face trials of many kinds because our hope is eternal and not in the temporary. And it goes on to say in verse 22, having purified your souls by your obedience to the truth for a sincere brotherly love, one, love one another earnestly from a pure heart since you have been born again, not of perishable seed, but of imperishable through the living and abiding word of God. Remember Psalm chapter one, right? We connect with the right kind of people. Having purified your souls by the obedience of the truth for a sincere brotherly love, love one another earnestly. There is a, a bond with the right kind of people. There is an unconditional love that is shared with the right kind of people. There's an acts of service with the right kind of people. And it's flowing from the Word of God. And it talks about obedience to the Word of God. And all of that, guys, comes from right priorities, right perspective, but is anchored in a living hope. And if you want to know what the key is, what I think is the key to happiness is having a right relationship with Jesus, being able to bask in the glory of His mercy and being able to have a hope in eternal life with Him and not being so consumed by the, the difficulties that life can bring us now. And it's really cool, I think, that, that God has hardwired us for, for happiness. And if you haven't read chapter 9 in Core 52, I'd encourage you to do so because it goes into some detail that I'm just not qualified to, to talk about. Like these chemicals that exist within us that, that are connected with each of these core things about being with the right group of people, being in the Word of God and, and living with acts of service. And I would say for me, one of the ways that I worship God, one of the ways that I actually feel happiness the most is when I'm serving other people. When I'm taking the time away and helping somebody else. And so I want to encourage you guys in a couple of different ways. The question is, what's your next step? But I want to suggest some next steps for you. Next step number one is that you and I, we develop that 
that attitude of rejoice always, pray continually, give thanks to God in all circumstances, right? And so you and I try to appreciate some of the things God has done. We go to Him in prayer and we allow that right perspective to change our attitude. The second thing is this. If, if happiness is embedded in us for connecting with other people, I want to encourage you to find a way to connect with some of the right people that are sitting right in this room. Uh, maybe you invite the, the guys over and you play a game of pool and you just talk about life, right? Maybe you invite the ladies over and you have a, a ladies' time and you leave the kids with the husbands, right? And you find a way to connect, to get together, to build these bridges of common unity. You engage in a grow group ministry, some sort of small group ministry that allows you to, to kind of maybe put your stuff aside and to step into a, a common bond that you can have with other people. And as iron sharpens iron, you can sharpen one another. Maybe a next step for you is to engage yourself in an act of service, right? And so you need to step back instead of saying, how, how can other people serve me? You need to step in and say, how can I serve other people? And so maybe you do this in, in your neighborhood. Maybe you do this in your workplace. Maybe you do this with complete strangers. Or maybe you do this right here at Connection. And you go, you know what? I, I can help. There's something I can do. I can lend myself to this. And I want to promise you, I want to promise you this. If you can anchor yourself in the Word of God, if you can get with the right kind of people, and if you can engage in acts of service with the right motive, you are going to experience a deeper level of happiness. But all of it comes back to having perspective, priorities, and a living hope. So what's your next step?